Welcome, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Daniel Coleman, and I'm the chair of the Writer in Residence Committee. I just want to recognize where we are, which is on Zoom, but uh, we are in the territory <laughs> of Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe people here at the head of Lake Ontario. Those of you who live in the region, you can actually see the dish with one spoon that is spoken about in the wampum agreement that was made in this place. Uh, long before Europeans arrived here. You can stand on the escarpment and see the incredible provision of nature that is made in this area. And we're so fortunate to live here. And when you look around this Zoom screen, you can see precisely why we're so fortunate to live here because of all these amazing writers who have been working with uh, Janet Rogers over the course of this year. And part of the function of today's gathering is to celebrate Janet's being the Mabel Pugh Taylor writer in residence over the past year, and the people who have developed their writing and work with Janet over the past year. So just a few words about, for those of you who may be new to the writer in residence, Mabel Pugh Taylor um, was a public librarian and an avid reader and writer whose family has given money for this residence to exist. And since that time, we've been developing this residency over the years um, in partnership with the Hamilton Public Library and with Hamilton or McMaster Libraries, as well as the Department of English at McMaster University. And so we were so happy to be able to welcome Janet Rogers here um, a little more than a year ago, um, just around the time that COVID struck the first time. And uh, Janet uh, adapted to that circumstance of having to do a residency that would have been in person and in the offices at McMaster and at the public library, doing it online. And uh, we know we've all had to adapt this year. I hope you're safe and that the people that you love are around you and that you have a chance to check in for the writers you love who are here with us today presenting their work. Um, Janet, I just wanna say from me and from the Writer in Residence Committee, we've enjoyed working with you so much this year and your adaptability, creativity, dynamic has been such a pleasure to work with. Um, for the people who don't know, uh, Janet's um, a poet, a spoken word artist, a filmmaker, a radio broadcaster who works in many domains. Her most recent book, is Ego of a Nation, published by Ogisto Publishing, which is her publishing house, which she has launched on the territory of the Six Nations this year. And so there's so much to pick, get, check, check out in Janet's productive life that you can have a look for her website and check in on that. But um, so as not to take up lots of time at the beginning of this event, I'm gonna pass the talking over to Janet Rogers with great gratitude for your presence with us this year. Nyaragoa, thank you. Oh, thanks, everybody. And thank you, Daniel. Um, you know, I really want to say a, a, a heartfelt thank you to Daniel, who is the chair of the um, Writer and Resident, Residence Committee, uh, for choosing me because it was, a, it was great timing. Uh, coming home to Six Nations, having lived on, as a guest on Coast Salish territory for 25 years. And this really like sliding into this position has really helped me to ground myself in back in my territory and also to learn who's out there in terms of the um, beautiful talents of, of writers in the literary fields. So I'm just so pleased everyone could join us today. We are featuring um, 11 of the writers who I've been in consultation with throughout the um, my term as the writer in residence. And what a joy, like I absolutely love talking about story. I love connecting with the writers. So for me, it was absolutely fulfilling and gratifying um, that part of the residency. And I'm so pleased to um, uh, have this event at the end of National Poetry Month. We wanna recognize that as well as the end of the, of the um, residency to offer a space and time for um, the writers. And yes, there are new writers. And some people are reading for the very, very first time. And so, you know, I'm excited for that aspect and that they've in, in brought their friends and their families into this event as well. So thanks everybody for joining and supporting these new voices and these new writers. Hopefully we're going to hear tons more 
uh, from everybody. Um, I think that's it for now. I don't want to chat too much either because uh, we're going to dive right on in. And up first, we have Lori Sebastianuti. Lori is um, joining us from the Hamilton Mountain, Lori, if I recall. Uh, Stony Creek Mountain. Stony Creek Mountain. Mm -hmm. And um, it was so wonderful to work with Lori because she's she was writing about a time in the 80s, which of course I was growing up in the 80s. And so I could really relate to a lot of what's in her story. And is, tell us what you're going to um, share with us today, Laura, if you wouldn't mind. Awesome. Okay, I'll be reading an essay that uh, was published this winter in the New Quarterly, um, and it does talk talk a bit about my '80s upbringing. And can you hear me? Okay. And um, and it's, uh, this one actually focuses on a crisis of faith that I had and how I was able to move through it. And I I do talk about uh, growing up uh, Italian Catholic and and kind of that formation. So I'll be reading about that. Okay, all set? Awesome, thanks. Thank you, Janet, thank you so much. So the essay is called Seeing in 3D and I'll be reading the first section. Order. I used to think I was eating tiny eyeballs. Every December 13th, while my, my siblings and I played around a hissing brick fireplace and my father watched The Price is Right, my mother would drive down to my Aunt Lucy's house down the road to pick up a large pot of cuchilla. On the first day of, on the feast day of St. Lucy, my Aunt Lucy would prepare the traditional Sicilian dish of boiled wheat berries and sugar. Some years she would add chickpeas for heft, but to us, it made no difference. We would listen for the sound of the garage door opening, followed by my mother's hollers, and the six of us would take our place around a large oak dinner table with my father at the head to slurp the beige goopy stew. Just a taste, my mother would say to them, but to me, she'd offer a stern look, tie a checkered dishcloth around my neck and remind me every last drop for your eyes. At two and a half, I was diagnosed with strabismus. My mother had a moment of denial when her sister-in-law pointed out that my left eye would turn inward like a wayward pinball, especially when I was tired or concentrating. But a doctor confirmed the diagnosis and before I could speak in full sentences, I was fitted for corrective glasses. At seven, I had my first surgery at St. Joseph's Hospital in Hamilton. That was unsuccessful. But when I was 13, a promising young surgeon operating out of sick kids in Toronto would be the answer to our prayers. No more tantrums, smashing glasses on the floor, no more four eyes and incessant teasing on the playground. A brand new teenager with a brand new set of eyes. The only stipulation was another prescription, this time for contact lenses to help my eyes focus and prevent an eye-turning setback. St. Lucy had worked her magic. Aesthetically speaking, I was cured. St. Lucy, the name derives from the Latin lux, meaning light, is the patron saint of eye disease. She was born around 283 CE in the Eastern Sicilian town of Siracusa. Young Lucy had no interest in marrying and had already cons consecrated her virginity to Jesus, while this did not sit well with her betrothed. He was expecting to inherit her large, large dowry, so he reported her to the local governor, Pascius. At the time, Christianity was prohibited in the Roman Empire, and the governor ordered her to a brothel, but legend states that she was immovable. After a failed attempt to burn her alive, soldiers ultimately succeeded in taking her life with a dagger to the throat. By the 15th century, Lucy's story had changed. By then, tradition had her gouging out her eyes to discourage a persistent suitor, as well as their miraculous return by the time she was laid to rest. Cuchilla is the dish that commemorates St. Lucy saving her hometown of Siracusa from famine in the 17th century. When a cargo of wheat arrived at the city's port on December 13th, starving townspeople did not grind the wheat berries into flour to make bread or pasta. They simply boiled the berries and consumed them hot. I still feel for those townspeople. I used to swallow whole tablespoons with my nose plugged to dull the taste, and I never let my teeth make contact with the soggy berries. As much as I wanted St. Lucy to straighten my eyes, I didn't want to know what eyeballs tasted like. Leaving Sicily at the age of eight did nothing to weaken Catholicism's hold on my mother, who was named after the Blessed Mother, a fact she takes great pride in. She attended an all-girls Catholic private school where all her teachers were nuns. 
I love them, she told me once when I was helping her peel the ends of green beans. I told those nuns everything. They were my confidants. As the youngest of 12 children with strict Sicilian parents, young Maria was in desperate need of someone to confide in. Things she was not permitted to do in 1960s Hamilton included riding a bike, wearing shorts or a bathing suit, swimming, spending Saturday nights with her friends, or being alone with a male who wasn't a relative. Her father forbade her from taking the one-year post-secondary nursing course that she asked to enroll in because he did not want her tending to the needs of naked men. The sisters, meanwhile, listened to her, told her to pray for strength and to trust that God had a plan. My mother went to mass every morning before class and took solace in the readings and continued the tradition of faithful mass attendance after marriage to my father. Sunday mornings in our family meant waking up to the scent of sizzling garlic and freshly percolated espresso. Once the midday meal was prepared, fresh sauce, breaded veal cutlets, grilled eggplant and sauteed rapini, my mother would load us into our cream colored station wagon to get us to the 11 o'clock mass. My father had more interest in watching his soccer games live from Italy than in joining his wife and six kids in the pew. So he stayed behind with his hot espresso to yell at the TV, his gold crucifix jumping and tangling with the black chest hair that sprouted from underneath his white undershirt. The six of us all had Catholic, Catholic schooling and my eldest sister was among the first cohort of students to attend Ontario's fully funded Catholic high schools. Unlike the non-Catholic kids I knew, we learned about Jesus and his teachings. Love one another as I have loved you. My grade five teacher said it was the greatest of his commandments. Choir practice every week in the gymnasium meant 300 kids sitting cross-legged on the floor, necks cranked up to follow along with the lyrics projected onto the wall while our teachers strummed on their guitars. High school found us in red and blue kilts and gold baptismal crosses flirting with boys at our lockers. We sat on the bleachers during mass and tried to use our 1980s bangs to cover our sooty foreheads on Ash Wednesday. The majority of the kids at my high school were the children of Italian, Croatian and Portuguese immigrants. Being Catholic was simply part of our hyphenated identity. To me, Italian Canadian and Italian Catholic were interchangeable. The only Italian I knew who was not Catholic was the man who delivered the crusty round loaves of bread to our house every Wednesday. There were a lot of things my father had to acclimate to when he immigrated, but Wonder Bread wasn't one of them. Our bread men had converted from Catholicism to become Jehovah's Witness. Thank the Lord his mother was already dead when he converted, my mother said once after paying him and closing the front door. I hope if any of you leave the church, you'll do it after I'm gone. Thank you. Wow, fantastic! <laughs> what did Lori? What did that? What did the 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 berries taste like? Um, I just remember them being mushy and a little bit sweet, but also very earthy. And I didn't enjoy them. Okay, but I had to eat a whole bowl because <laughs> of tradition and right. and superstition and those kinds of things. Right. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Janet. Thank you very much. Um, next, we have uh, Ramona. Ma I want to say, and Ramona, please correct me. I'm going to attempt your name. Mahaber. Mahaber. That's close enough. I don't particularly know how to say it because of, uh, you know, my parents moving from place to place and the culture getting lost. And yeah. Well, that's very generous of you. <laughs> Ramona, please introduce yourself and let us know what you're going to share today, please. So my name's Ramona. Um, I'm a student in English and Cultural Studies. Right now I'm in Westdale, Hamilton, Ontario, and I'm giving short stories a shot. Here's the first short story I've ever written. It's called Walrus. The boy was on loan to his father for the first week of summer holiday. They were returning from an outing to the great rocks by the coast, the boy's pants pockets heavy with the stones and shells he had looted. The boy looked cartoonish, consumed by a yellow nylon bucket hat. The woman in the passenger seat didn't speak good English. She didn't need to. The three of them, the boy, the father, the woman, stopped to eat at a fast food restaurant. 
A dirty bearded man nicked ketchup and pepper packets off of abandoned red plastic trays. He looked ugly. The father and the woman laughed. The boy stared at a greenish black bottle fly lugging itself across the greasy tiled floor. The boy picked at his cuticles, dropping the small rectangles of skin down to the insect. He wanted to see if it would feed. The boy pictured himself at a pond. He was tossing bread to pond ducks. A green-headed mallard guzzled bread. The woman laughed. The boy was to spend much of the week in a very small and sterile white box. The box held a little bed that matched a little nightstand. Atop this stood a lamp with a broken and knotted pull chain and a photograph of the boy and his mother and his father. A dirty square of glass pressed down on their three faces. The boy made room for a milky beaked beach shell he had pocketed. Its shape made the boy think of a dead ear. He could almost shout that it was his favorite thing. The boy awoke, frightened. His bedclothes were damp, soiled. His hand tugged on the knotted pull chain of the little lamp, which flickered on and sputtered out a dim light. The boy rubbed his eyes. They were wet like raw eggs in the meat of his face. The boy looked to the shell. He saw a protrusion jutting out from between its two halves. It was a bulbous, wet mass. It was the color of bare muscle, the muddy hue of a bruise. The, under, the other end of it, this clam's tongue, was stuck fast to the dirty glass of the little family portrait, stuck right over his father's face. He was being licked. The boy felt itchy. He used his little fingers to tear the clam from the photograph. He threw the shell down to the carpeted floor of his little room. It did not shatter. The boy lifted his foot, bringing it down square and firm. The skin of his ankle shone in the lamplight. He stamped again and again. He continued to, long after there were no cracks left to be felt. That's my story. Thank you. <laughs> it's amazing. I remember, I remember that story. I remember thinking... This is where prose and, well, fantastic fiction kind of are overlapping one another. And I really enjoyed the images that you wrote into the story because it's very vivid. And um, yeah, are you going to, what do you plan to do? Hopefully write writing. a bunch. Yeah, keep writing a bunch. Uh, get the opinions of friends and some profs that I'm pretty close with and We'll see what happens from there. <laughs> yes, right on. Well done. Thank you, Ramona. Appreciate that. Elbert, what have you got to share with us? And please introduce yourself. And thank you for coming. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is El Bird. Um, I am a uh, Indigenous writer from originally from Manitoba, currently residing in Saskatchewan with uh, Ty McMaster. Um, yeah, I come from a great big family of academics and passionate readers and writers. And um, my hope today is to read some of my poetry that Janet has consulted on. And I hope you guys enjoy. Uh, my first work here is uh, something I wrote this year uh, entitled Conservative Dysphoria. Am I just the empty chamber? waiting for some spawn to break my unencumbered self and being. An empty shell of reproduction resisting the concept of bearing. I already bear too much, full of stuffy emotions, past harms, and conflicting desires for nothing more than simple affections and adult adoration, without the promise of reproduction. I've never pretended to know of a line I can carry or cross for someone else's unconsented awareness in this world, with all its evil and confusion and lackluster rewards. How could I ever subject that innocent child to an existence stained with inexperienced matrimonies, generational grief, and a lineage of my own self-hatred? What kind of life would await the quiet cry for milk that has long since been spilled, mixed with blood from scars that continually reopen to shed something different from a tear. Instead of Teddy, I'd have to offer my own calloused hand, only to retrieve it again, to cover my cries as my petulant inner child begs for the comfort I owe myself. How can the notion of birth 
ever cross my awareness if the child in me still cries out for adoption. That's the end. Woo. Woo. Snaps and claps. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, hey, can you remind us, Elle, um, your, your, your sister is at Mac and has a, a writing group? Is that, can you remind us what that is? Um, so I'm, I'm not quite sure on the, the details of Joe's writing group, but my sister, Johanna Bird, is currently working on her dissertation through McMaster, um, currently writing on uh, Indigenous women uh, poets, and has actually written poetry herself. <laughs> Yes, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and very and, lucky. Yeah, I think Shane Shan is part of that writing group, and I think John, you're you're also affiliated with that writing group. So so I'm happy to hear. You know, there's, you know, after I leave, there's other resources people can can take advantage of within absolutely the community. So yeah, so that's wonderful. Thank you for your poem. I appreciate that. Thank you. Do I have time for one more? Um, I should think so. Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. Um. This is another poem I wrote called Contact. Plunge yourself into the galaxies lying between you and I, the darkest depths below each soul that lie within each passerby. Those undeniable, undeniable complexities compelling compassionate, I'm so sorry, those undeniable complexities compelling companionship to dock that crafts residents can traverse the uncharted territories of every person's galaxy. The finger's fateful tap causing gaseous stars to freeze and seize up into a tightly twisted mass. A clumping of chaos centered into cemented structure and brought to borrowed bonds. Caves of hollowed spaces lying in gasping want of those co covalent bonds that ask for structure spared from separation to not be touched, but left alone, looking for succinct isolation. Touched, tapped, then imploded into a compressed galaxy, an isolated black hole, or exploded, erupting a fragrant deterioration, a detonating selfhood. These galaxies touch, disturbed they flow into the, disturbed they flow into the cosmos that envelops. Alarmed, they dance in the fellowship of chaos. Despairing, they laugh in the ecstasy of anxiety. Looking, they part in hope of finding more galaxies. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Janet, for this opportunity. It really means a lot to me. Yeah, well, you know, it's wonderful that people step up. Like, it's a really a brave thing. It really is. I, I, I commend all of your bravery, you know. Um, and I and often in the consultations, if you recall, I always say, you know, it, to be a writer, you have to also read. And I know that that comes as some, you know, sad news to people that just want to, you know, write. Uh, but pre learning to present your work is also so I'm happy that we, that we have through this residency created that opportunity. And thank you again for stepping up. And thanks for your beautiful poems. And um, Paige Mela is next. And I just want to say that, you know, of course, I love all of you. Uh, <laughs> but there was something about Paige's writing um, that I knew was kind of next level. And to be have to be given the um, the great honor to, you know, pass my eyes over a chapter or two of uh, Paige's manuscript. Uh, was 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 it just it just opened me up like it it it, it helped my energy to, to 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 rise and it helped my heart to open because it was just brilliant and I have to say that Paige then went on to seek out an agent and Paige has an agent now and uh, on their way take it away Paige oh thank you so much Janet I really appreciate that and thank you Daniel um, so I'm just going to give a, a brief introduction here as I was asked to do that. So uh, during my graduate work at McMaster, I was supervised by uh, Dr. Sarah Brophy on a thesis I themed around trans autobiography, digital identity creation, and critical illness. Uh, while that project remains uncompleted, I took those themes and reworked them into a personal memoir, which I have titled Together in Electric Dreams. 
And I have since accepted, as uh, Janet mentioned, representation by Shalene Knight of uh, Transatlantic Literary Agency. Um, we'll be reaching out to publishers shortly. Uh, my memoir is part coming out story, part romance, and focuses on a time where I was recovering from cancer and struggling with my identity. Um, though I was very ill and unable to interact with the real world during this time, I expressed myself and took my first steps as a trans woman through online worlds. In this memoir, I draw the reader into those virtual spaces with me. Uh, bringing them into video games and virtual social environments like Second Life, and back out again to illustrate the immersive, formative, and experimental value of online worlds. So I'm going to be reading you an excerpt from the beginning of Chapter 9, and it's set in 2010. Emerging from a cloud of rose-scented mist, Callie's orange and black face glows under the neon heart buzzing from the tunnel's rocky wall. We float together in a giant rubber duck that pulls us along a submerged track towards an expanding arch of light. Distant sunlight gleams off the duck's water-sprinkled plastic wings and reflects a rainbow shimmer on the sequin lining of my bridal gown. Callie caresses my ears. So, what do you think? Best honeymoon ever, I say. We're only getting started. Callie teases, hinting a sly smirk as he pulls me close. I rest my cheek against his suit-covered chest, allowing myself to melt into the relaxing vibration of his affectionate purring. Being here, having him holding me, sharing this moment together in an actual tunnel of love with my husband, my maid, has made all the frantic fuss of the past two weeks of wedding planning mayhem worthwhile. This does truly feel perfect, even though I know that none of this is real, not in the way most people value realness. I know this amusement park we're in, this plastic duck boat, and even Callie and my avatar's bodies are just lines of code stored on a softly humming server somewhere. Despite all of that, I can feel it. That nameless closeness, that intimacy and trust, that comes from someone you have shared your bed and life with. In real life, we search for signs that show our, our partner cares for us. Those selfless, loving gestures, like making you a cup of coffee just the way you like it, without being prompted on a tough day. Or you might swoon over an expensive sweater, and a week later they surprise you with it, even if it's not your birthday. It can be something as small as letting you be the little spoon as you drift off to sleep. Despite what you might think, sometimes these gestures mean more online. Take Callie's suit as an example. If he and I married in real life, he might pick out a suit. A tailor would measure him and make alterations, but all Callie's done is point and pay and pick it up when it's ready. Here, Callie likely tried on multiple suits from multiple online vendors, still spent real life money to buy it, but then he sank hours in an editor, lovingly tweaking the suit's proportions to accommodate his unique furry body. I know because it took me three days to find and fit a bridal dress that showed my tail and a veil that didn't cut off my ears. Callie bought an emerald ring for me, and while he likely didn't spend too much real money to get it, he took the time to find out that I preferred emeralds over diamonds. Those things still matter here. He also scouted this abandoned amusement park for us to be alone. Such thoughtful kindnesses are more than I've ever experienced in a, in a real life relationship. I believe in some ways online relationships better show one's commitment. In real life, we might walk together your hand might bump mine and we would hold hands. It would be sweet, but there's a casualness to this act that doesn't occur online. In virtual spaces, we might similarly walk together, but you would need to intentionally position your character closer to mine, target me and initiate a command like slash hold hands with Sonora. And while stepping out of a romantic moment to type something may sound disconnected, if I consider my partner values the time 
required to write an affectionate gesture specifically because they want to build a connection between us, doesn't that add something? Describing a character's actions here are not only specific and intentional, but every descriptive pose my partner writes is only for me, for us, to create this memorable moment that they have committed body and mind to. Whether we're holding hands or fighting or fucking, we craft line after line of descriptive prose, a conscious poetic rededication to the value of our relationship. So yes, I, I know our relationship, our marriage, and this moment are not real in the way society might value it. But for a lonely and very sick trans woman, it's everything. Besides, don't the scientists say reality as we understand it might be lines of code anyway? Thank you. Wow. Uh, wow. In two, if that was written in 2010, that's very much ahead of its time. Did oh, it, take, uh, <laughs> it wasn't written in 2010. That, that so scene, scene particular right? scene was, was from 2010. So okay. it, yeah, just moments of my memoir kind of jumped back and forth in time from closer to the present and into the past. So this is a moment from the past. Thank you. And so well read. Thank you very much. Beautifully done. Oh, thank you. Um, people are doing everything online i can't even i don't even want to know you know what i mean like i don't even want it don't even let me know about it <laughs> but that's so wonderful and and again great writing well read so fantastic thank you for sharing that page good luck with the finding just the right publisher oh thank you yes uh we, we've got plans brewing excellent good to hear good to <laughs> thank hear. you excellent. um shan Powell is up next. And I remember doing consultation with Shan and we had a good old chat, um, yeah, about Inuit um, culture and um, a lot of different things. That, and um, there was, I was trying to find a book that would be um, beneficial to you. And I couldn't find it when we were chatting, but I have now since found it. So I'm gonna send you the title um, and it is from um, Thetis uh, Books. So I'll send you all that info, uh, Shan, and then you, I think you'll find it really interesting. Okay. Yeah. Um, so tell us what you're going to share today, please. Uh, I'm going to be sharing some of my poetry today. Uh, I've been working a lot in Inuit themes, and I've been braiding them into it, uh, giving precedence to Inuktut, which is a language I do not speak, but I'm trying to learn. So for those of you who do speak and understand Inuktut, Give me a little bit of patience because this is not the tongue that I was born with and the words don't really fit properly in my mouth. <laughs> um, so Atilehai and Ulukut, Uvanga Shan, Uvanga Kitchener Mute, which basically, hi everyone, I'm Shan and I am an urban Inuk who lives in Kitchener, Ontario right now. I come from a nomadic family. I have lived all over the Atlantic provinces and all over British Columbia. And I currently reside on the Haldeman Tract uh, in so-called Kitchener. Uh, the first piece that I'd like to read has recently been accepted into, there's a big show going on in Seattle uh, called Women and Whales First. And uh, the collection's being called Poetry in a Climate of Change. And this one is actually the only poem I've written specifically to measure because I had to write a pantoum and I have never heard of a pantoum before. And I'm like, okay, what is this? And I guess I did it right because they accepted it and now it's in print. So here we go. I call it an unilit, those which breathe. Wild haired woman of the water, forced and flung from Anguda's kayak. Mother to the sea with ice flows for clouds, his paddle smashes finger flanges. Forced and flung from Angora's kayak, bleeding broken fingers transform, his paddle smashes finger flanges, a near kneely with flippers and fins. Bleeding broken fingers transform, and a phalanx becomes a whale, a near kneely with flippers and fins. Nulyayuk will never again be alone. And a phalanx becomes a whale. 
Her phantom fingers breathe and swim. Nulia Yak will never again be alone. She makes their camp in Atliwin. Her phantom fingers breathe and swim. Drip sweet water from your mouth to theirs. She makes their camp in Atliwin. We must maintain equilibrium. Drip sweet water from your mouth to theirs. I speak to you of Nulyayok. We must maintain equilibrium, wife to a red and white dog. I speak to you of Nulyayok, wild haired woman of the water, wife to a red and white dog, mother to the sea with ice floats for clouds. The next piece I have, uh, I actually wrote this one, I edited it yesterday and this morning. So this one is very fresh and I call it Spider Woman Meets Kivyok. And here you go. My sod roofed hut is sodden within and without. The roof is drenched with the mist which always shrouds this veil of scrubby trees and sphagnum. And the inside? Ah, that is the moisture from my cooking pot. Men are stacked around me in neat piles. Today is the boiling day, when marrow bone femurs seep their flavors into richness. The meat isn't fatty enough, so I add seal oil until it swims on the surface. Round floating islands grab at one another in a large amber slick, then scatter like lemmings when I stir the pot and poke down any protruding bones. I sing to myself while I cook. My eyebrows hang down over my eyes, blinding me to all but my work. Off to my side, I hear a moan. The men stacked like firewood speak to me. Push us into the cauldron, they say, but they will all have to wait their turns. Spiders creep like lichen across my arms. They are my children, and tonight we shall sup well. The roof is always making sounds. Bugs burrow in, making nests, making worms, until on the rainy days, water and maggots patter down onto my earthen floor. I scoop them up and eat them by the handful or feed them to my children. This is the best time to be alive. I have no use for the frozen times, so I die, we die. And when the rains come to melt away the snow and drench the bogs with water and larvae, I resurrect myself and weave an orb as a cradle for my youngest. The sounds of the creeping things bring me comfort. The sounds of my fire bring me joy. The sound I hear now brings me confusion. What is that great noise? I don't know it. It is not the sound of my stew, of my crackling embers, my shaking fire, my sprinkling rain, my moaning stack of corpses. No, it is something new. I look up, but my eyebrows dangle in my way. No matter. I don't need them on my face anyhow. I slice them off with my knife, pop them into my mouth, and look up into the shocked face of a living man. The next one I have, I call Nulia Yuk's Promise, and this is another one that I edited over the last uh, day or two. <clears throat> Deep within water's womb, I watch my children swim. They soar and glide with a grace rarely seen upon the surface. Light shines through the cracks of melting ice packs. It comes slowly to the deep dark wending its way around the bodies of whales, bouncing its way off gleaming fish scales, caroming off the enormous edges of icebergs and drifting down to me in whispers and murmurs. I am never alone down here. And in the long night, when brother moon chases sister sun below the edge of the sky, when the red and green spirit lights of those who bled to death slumber, I rest below the gray dark ice, tending the kulik in the company of the knuckleborn. Pinnipeds sing of the swash where land abuts sea and sky, and I send shimmering shoals to the land wash when you treat my children respectfully. Cetaceans recount what they seek in that space where salt sky meets the sea. 
But sometimes the stories they tell fill me with an anger and compel me to unfurl my tattooed tail, propel myself up, 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 and I wait just below the surface of the water's edge. You squander my gifts, foul the sea, wound without chilling, withhold that final sip of sweet water in an act of casual cruelty. I will take your children, tuck them into my emotic and descend to the deep. Your babies join my own and I will never, no, I will never be alone. The next one uh, I'd like to read. I think we're, are we at time? Oh, we might be at, at time. time. I think we might be at time. I don't want to cut anybody off, but I think okay. we might. Okay, yeah. I don't want I don't want to go too long. Okay. Yeah, I think you know what? I did we talk about um your pieces ever getting recorded? Did we have that conversation? No. I mean, I know this isn't like, you know, consultation time, but um because it's there's so much beautiful um visuals with that, like I'm seeing a play, I'm seeing animation with that. So mm -hmm. we can talk and I just want to um let people know that, you know, one of my very first, if not my very first writing mentor was um, Richard Van Camp, who's a great storyteller, mm -hmm. Dene Dogrib um, person from Yellowknife. And he, you know, when, when he mentors you, you have a mentor for life. And um, I'm not going to extend that <laughs> to everybody here, but, you know, if you do ever, you know, need to need uh, some feedback, please, by all means, I'm going to share, I'll share my other email with you because there is another writer in residence coming in in the fall. Is that right, Daniel? So yeah, so, or, or you, or consult with them or consult with the new writer in residence. So just remember that, that this program, it keeps going as the E residence, which is so great. Yeah. Um, but yes, I mean, you know, cause it's, it's so personal. It's so, it's so intimate. Uh, that it's it's difficult to kind of break away and go, okay, you're on your own now kind of thing, right? But that was lovely, Shan. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Miao Boa. Thank you so much. Michelle Thomas. Now, if anybody needs uh, a voiceover work or needs just to chill the heck out, listen to Michelle Thomas as she reads because it's it's medicine absolute medicine and I loved consulting with Michelle because Michelle is on here on the territory and it was gosh last summer hey Michelle we social distanced but we got to see each other in person and talk about her beautiful book of poems and Michelle went ahead and 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 got that book done all on her own so let's let's uh, yes well done introduce yourself Michelle and let us know what you're going to share please if you wouldn't mind okay uh Michelle Thomas, I'm here here at Six Nations, and it's just great to have Jen at home because <laughs> she uh, was in BC for a long time, and I met her originally out there. So it's it's really great to have this kind of support in our, my own backyard. Um, so for myself, um, this book of poetry kind of birthed itself during COVID. Like I literally started. March of last year, and it was uh, self-published, and I did a book launch in November um, through Amazon uh, Direct Publishing. So yeah, it was very quick and um, hot and easy and fast, <laughs> and it had to be put out like that, right? And a lot of it um, tends to revolve around uh, grief and my experiences with grief. So I divided this book into chat into seasons. So I'm going to, if I have enough time, I'm just going to put my timer on. I am going to try to read one from each season. So this first one is from spring and it's called skin. The weight of my brown skin lies heavy with me tonight. Wishing I could chuck it off and wash it in the rain. Hang it on the line letting cool floral breezes revive it, walking about like nothingness without a care in the world, weightless, free, unattached and unadorned, unidentified, indiscernible to the naked eye, my cool brown skin instead lies with me, pulls up my frame, does roll call to all those that came before it and those yet to come. 
My skin leads me to my place in the circle and helps me remember all that I am, all that I am yet to be. My beautiful brown skin, shorn from the depths of Mother Earth, reminds me but I am but transient, making my journey here for a while in hopes of an easier path for those who may follow. So that was spring. <laughs> uh, this next one is from summer and it's called My Space, My Home. There is safety now in this space I've inhabited for 47 years. It is rich and warm. It coats my insides. My space has made peace with stillness that once whispered distorted messages of who I thought it was. Now, the stillness invites me in for tea as we linger over silence and breath. Gone are the days of transient spirit shifting from dimension to dimension. I embody myself, embracing my plump juiciness full of vital life force. My space is my home now. So that was uh, summer. And we have one. Uh, I'm looking for the one I want it to do for fall. Okay, so this one is called Unfolding. The unfolding of my heart came like a thief in the night with silence and stealth. Connection calmly crept in without a peep. It gently pulled off the layers, peeled back the duct tape, unraveled the string in one swift motion. Breath came in. Handy accomplice neutralized all the solutions that held my heart together. Beauty and rawness captivated me as tears of joy flowed down my cheeks. Freedom, my oar. So that was fall. Um, and winter. Wow. Um, the many phases of moon, this is called. In all her glory, she takes my breath away. She takes me by the hand and pulls me into her silent reverie, where we sit drinking in her scent, soaking in her raw beauty at long last. We reveal ourselves to each other. Under her gaze, I feel more. I love more, I want more, I am more. And this last one is winter. It's called Dani To. I completed all that I needed to as I held your hand and carried you on the road to heaven. I lifted you into creator's arms as you took your last earthly breath. We circled you in love as one door closed and another opened. We sang sweet songs of sustenance for your journey. Our voices held creator's highest vibration as you were released into the sacred silence of pure light. Electric air popped and sizzled like stardust in the night sky. You were free, Donnie. Donnie, wow, beautiful, <laughs> absolutely. That's what I'm talking about, the medicine, the medicine from the words and they're real and they're honest and authentic. And, you know, it was it was an honor to work with your pieces. It was beautiful. So thank you, Michelle, for that. Yeah. 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 Um, I think this might be the most Haudenosaunee writers in one meeting ever. Tell <laughs> 
and that wasn't planned. Uh, <laughs> that's just what happens, I guess. Because John Hill is also from Six, and um, it's 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 it, when when John uh, submitted some work for the podcast and created, you know, again, that was um, a wonderful uh, time because we, you know, the idea of creating a podcast then turned into two podcasts. And it was, again, brave work when people uh, who submitted, they also recorded their work so we could hear their their original work read in their original voice. And so John also did that and listen close because his stuff is real good too. John, take it away. Thank you so much, Janet. And again, I want to stress very much, I want to say, um, Johanna Bird's name was mentioned earlier. Um, Johanna Bird and Janet uh, Rogers were the two people who really gave me um, the confidence and the strength to do what I do. Uh, I've been doing what I've been doing for the past 12 years, but it's um, it was only when I met strong um, women who empowered me that I was actually able to go out and do it. And um, Johanna Bird is a great person. And uh, yeah, I, I just want to say now to them. Uh, so yeah, my name is John. Uh, my pronouns are he and they. And uh, yeah, I have some poems to read. Um, this poem I wrote is uh, one of my very famous award losing poems. Um, I wrote it uh, during a very angry time. And uh, April 30th for me represents a lot of things, but I think after what I've heard today, it will represent new things, better things. Um, but this is a poem that I wrote. Uh, it's called Do You Work Here? On working at a museum as an indigenous person. <clears throat> Be honest. Do I look like an exhibitionist? What about my face, my braid, or my brown skin says I am less than another employee? You, 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 said with such contempt, credit to you. Most people have yet to train their face not to betray their blatant distaste. Work. Work is a fine concept, a noun, a verb, a class, a skill. You might say I work, whether I'm one of the Indians on display or just another Indian behind the desk. I stand on guard for these lithographic abstractions. Meanwhile, I count your heartbeats in your periphery. I'm out of your vision. There's no vision for me. You see me, you think you know me and my story, but I know what guilt sounds like before he leaps out of your throat, transmogrified into defensiveness. Oh. Here is to us indigenous, like an orphan we all lost. Traditional dance floors used to be here. My ancestors once built longhouses here. Now here is where they still hang Indians on display for all to see while I am still haunted by ghosts as I cross the rainy streets. So uh, that is uh, my poem, Do You Work Here? Um, uh, next, I have another poem uh, and I think it'll be uh, the last one I read uh, for tonight. Um, but uh, yeah, again, thank you to Janet. Thank you to everyone for being here. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> this poem is untitled. It was my right to pull you out of the growth and brush the dirt away, hold you in my arrays. It is ordinary for me. When I was young, I would hunt for sounds. All lyrics are improvised. My shins are strong, though they are full of holes, like returned aircraft with no need for reinforcements here. 
It is the knees that need patients the most. But as long as I bend and don't break, I will find you again. If others saw me and heard me call you forth from the soil, they would call me a madman and send pigs to search the dirt for blood and flesh. But I am merely searching for the words in the earth, foraging for verbiage, foliage for my verses. Thank you. Wow. Great stuff, John. Are you working towards publishing or what? Yeah, uh, you know, right now I'm just kind of in creation mode uh, for a very long time. Uh, I feel like I was just sort of running on contract employment, but, um, you know, really right now I'm focused on creation. I'm focused on editing, uh, getting better at editing, hopefully. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm very much focused on just sort of honing my craft and uh, networking and collaborating with others and yeah, hopefully getting something published very soon. Okay, good. Yeah, we need a book from you because that's what's really special. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so now, much. Nia Reed is up next. Nia, I know Nia. We were introduced by an auntie, literary auntie, and Nia is my sister. I mean, you know, in that way. And uh, Nia has gone, has throughout her career helped so many young poets and writers throughout her career. Uh, what you see on the streets out there in terms of poetry, in terms of slam, in terms of community, Nia has been a part of that. And it was a, such a joy to hear Nia's own writing because it's like, you know, the, the administrator will keep administrating. The, 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 the auntie will keep being auntie until you say, what about your work? And so I did that with Nia and Nia responded. Go ahead, Nia, introduce yourself and tell us what you're going to share. Thank you. Yeah, um, so my name is Nia Reed. Uh, the full name is Tianao Lavinia Finao Maiva Miranda Lily Nia Reed. Uh, I'm part Fijian, part Scottish. I'm the youngest of nine children and I'm a lover of chocolate. I believe that Belgian chocolates are a gateway chocolate for everyone. Um, and I am so grateful every time somebody, I'm so grateful, Janet, that you asked me to write, um, especially in the start of COVID. Um, you know, COVID has its ups and downs. You know, for me, COVID has been a bit of a blessing to be able to stop and really look at my life. And um, last year, Janet, when you asked me to write, it was an important time to stop and look at how life was going. Um, and sometimes you write and you find yourself on the page. So uh, this piece is a short story. It's called, Don't Call It Home. The woman who used to live, the woman who used to live in the apartment above me in 502 was oddly worse. She was a four day party of crown royal on the rocks, voices screaming over musics that rattled ceiling lights. I once drummed up the courage to knock on her door, intending to firmly request that she turn down her music. Three knocks and she swung open the door, wearing only her bra and panties, screaming, I'll get a fucking knife and cut you. To my surprise, I didn't back down. I stood my ground, clapped my hands in the air and responded, hello, are you here? Vacant eyed, she stared back and replied, fuck you. Needless to say, I never knocked on her door again, and she moved out 10 months later. Flash forward two years. It's Mother's Day, and the piano in apartment 502 has stopped playing. A, fi a fight has begun, stomping feet, thrown shoes, and FUs thwarted less accurately. I'm hesitant to move. After 10 weeks of social distancing, I know this moment can go either way. So I pray for the slamming of doors, a confirmation of white flags. After 10 weeks of social distancing, my neighbor in apartment 602 tells me her name is Jules and his name is Ivan and that Ivan steals cars for a living. My superintendent refers to him only as a metal scrapper and a problem. 
Either way, growth profiles of Ivan explain the flat cart that sits outside their apartment, piled high with dirty steel parts. After 10 weeks of social distancing, I know that the 11 a.m. clogging on floors is Jules running in platform heels from the back wall to the stripper pole that they've installed in their living room. I know that the metal will screech as Jules' body spirals on the pole, thundering with the twang as she dis dismounts. After 10 weeks of social distancing, I know that Jules and Ivan will blast music that will resurrect migraines whenever they damn well feel like it. And after 10 weeks of social distancing, I know that moments of peace are not long lived. I think to myself, I don't know how they can live like this. And then it dawns on me. I don't know how I can live like this. This apartment was supposed to be a stop along the way to having a better life, to finding peace. I remember when I was a kid, home was chaotic and uncertain, but mostly after a day of hard play, home was a shelter and a place to eat and fall asleep. When I was married, our home was chaotic and uncertain. Perhaps now I just live with my ghosts. I've learned to work myself into exhaustion, collapse as if being swallowed whole. This is my adult shield. Work till you don't feel the longing. Numb yourself to tolerance. Be so busy you're too tired to dream, to dream of a garden, of a quiet place to work and another to pray. Wear yourself thin, weeping lovers you don't have and all the ones who got away. Fill your spare time trying harder and failing your own expectations and leave yourself with a little less light than you give. This is the prescription to tuning out your life and calling it home. Thank you. Are you kidding me? Wow, wow. amazing, really great stuff. Really beautiful, can feel it, can feel it. The honesty, the authenticity, so beautiful and well-read. Um, Ellen Ryan, thank you for joining us today, Ellen. And um, if you would, please just introduce yourself and let us know what you're going to share. Thank you. I'm Ellen from Ancaster. Uh, this is a signature story from my emerging memoir. I present it here without the poems for brevity's sake. Writing my way through double vision. Did we get hit? My seat is almost horizontal and a strange silence fills the sunny day. I have lost track of time, but I remember that we were driving on a side road toward Sunday lunch at the family farm. Rear-ended, my husband Patrick says, that lady's airbag released. She didn't even slow down for the stop sign here. We were pushed into the intersection. The boys and I are okay. Are you? Not sure, my neck hurts, it hurts a lot. Six years after this lightning strike, I am still in rehab for double vision and vertigo. Both conditions make walking and reading difficult. My double vision overlaps letters vertically so that reading lines on a page is tough. I can read a page or three at good times in the day before the lines blur into each other. My coping strategies include read aloud friends, text to speech software, large aerial font on my computer and audiobooks. I'm able to work, but only part-time with a competent assistant. One night, I half wake from a lucid dream before dawn. I am walking in a cornfield, tasseled socks shoulder high. Ankle weights keep track of where my feet are as they did after the accident. Even with my walking stick, it is all I can do to walk upright. I scan the scene for landmarks, spot only an occasional towering sunflower. During the dream, I can see how confused walking relates to vision. The cornfields are the lines of text confusing me. The far off sunflowers are hard to grasp words, the ones I'm supposed to say or write. Write poems, a resonant voice demands. 
the white space around short lines will make it easier for you to read and write words. You will be able to write poems. My hands tremble as I shove cornstalks aside. How can this be, I ask? I haven't read poems since high school. Where does such an idea come from? The voice guides my scramble through the field. Again, I see myself at the podium closing a recent talk on dementia by reading three poems. These poems draw loving attention to the rich emotional life of people losing their short-term memory and ability to communicate. I tell our daughter afterwards about the audience being so moved that I omitted my usual summary comments. Lori goes on to tell our family at supper, mom recited poetry in her speech today. But I did not recite poetry. I only read poems. Who am I to recite or write poetry, I wonder, while I walk in the cornfield, my eyebrows lifting with surprise and curiosity. Next, my cornfield journey takes me to an image from the previous Christmas day. Our son Kevin is kneeling over the piano bench. Words to a new song are flowing from his pencil like water from a hose. I feel a pang of envy for Kevin's gift of song, recognizing that composing songs is beyond my tuneless voice. Now in the dream though, I imagine that perhaps I too can compose the words, if not the melody. I trudge farther into the cornfield, shoving my way through the path narrowed by hefty mature cobs. At home, my journals stand like soldiers on their shelf. Since the accident, I cannot read anything written with pencil or even a ballpoint pen. I need large, bold print to cope with double vision. It takes a long time to find suitable markers. Some have blunt tips. Some give off a stink which turns my stomach. Others dry up while I pause to think. Once I find children's Crayola markers, I'm able to journal again. Now the parade of 10 journals seems to press the question, where is all this journaling headed? I realize my path is opening out a bit and taking me closer to clusters of sunflowers. I notice them facing toward the light, push my face into a giant sunflower, tickled by its bomb. Now the golden flower clusters shift into sections among the scrawled lines in my journals where something stirred deep inside. These few word flowers shining in summer glow. It strikes me that I can take those color-filled flower clusters and arrange them on a page, lift them out of the thicket of cornrows, nurture them and set them off in a meadow of white space. I wake from my dream full of energy and resolve to write poetry, although I have no idea how to begin. I feel like a maple tree in spring, sap rising, buds about to burst. With mere white space and shorter lines, I will reconnect with ideas and creativity, I say to myself. The few words per line, few lines per stanza, and typical brevity of poetry offer a chance to read more naturally with less brain stress. Also, use of a few words pointing to powerful images allows me to take full advantage of my newly acquired read a little, think a lot skills. Shortly thereafter, my husband spots a notice for an adult education course on poetry entitled Call of the Spirit. I accept his offer to drive me to Toronto every other Saturday morning for the course. I anticipate lectures on the nature and techniques of poetry and a selection of great poems to analyze. I walk up the curved staircase to the classroom with legs shaking more than usual. Middle-aged women fill the room, chatting easily with each other. I soon hear from them that many take this course over and over again to keep writing poetry. Oh yes, they answer my query about the teacher. Al Moritz is a great poet and an attentive listener, but no, he does not do any direct teaching. <clears throat> Indeed, Al announces, for each session, you will be prepared to distribute 20 copies of your own new poem for critique by the group. I will comment last. 
no instruction, I think. How will I manage? Before I bolt out the door, the campus chimes root my feet, breathe through me, and bless my resolve. How can I give up this best chance to learn poetry? My beguiling dream has lured me into the creative life. Resilience grows as I dig deep and risk sharing my spirit. Soon after my first poetry course, I'm fortunate to join a writing group, which continues to inspire me 20 years later. I pay attention to the moment and set words within white space. I still wonder about the meaning of white space. Of course, it focuses the mind on the light within a few words, but it also holds the mystery of the unattainable whiteness of all colors working together. Thank you. Nice, very, very nice. Thank you, Ellen. That's beautiful. Yeah, there's, um, you know, people go to, you know, they, they commit and you've committed by traveling to Toronto and, <laughs> and to take the writing course and to find community because it, that's what it really takes. And I just wanted to say that, you know, um, before we, we run out of time, we're not rushing and we're not out of time, but I, before we, you know, end the um, program today, I just wanted to say that, you know, this is, uh, you've, you're talking about your dreams. And last week we had the honor of uh, talking to uh, the parliamentary poet laureate, um, Louise Bernice Half, who is Cree, and she's the first indigenous um, parliamentary poet laureate. And she joined, yes, from Saskatchewan, uh, L. And, um, uh, she was talking about writing poetry from her dreams as well. And, mm. uh, and you know, so it's, it, that's how intimate this work is. That's how, you know, powerful this work is. And, uh, and before we move on to the next writer, I, again, I just want to say this too, the idea of the end events was turned, you know, split like an atom from one event. And now it became two events because it was so special to have, um, uh, Louise Bernice half and then you know we again I wanted to create an opportunity for um, for the people I've been working with to to read and so thank you to you know Daniel and Kathleen and everybody uh, Vivian and um, Shelly and Lisa and everybody uh, the hosts of this um, residency they, they, they just kind of let me do my thing <laughs> which is like you know it's so it's it's such an honor so thank you for that trust Cher Obadiah, who is reading next, was actually, I think, my very first customer who came in uh, to for a writing consultation. And um, I, I have never seen writing that change so rapidly and so drastically in the little, in the short amount of time that we did work together. And, and I'm happy to say that Cher was a repeat customer because we, we had the time to do that. And so, and, and Cher, I believe your, your, your book is on its way, yes? Yes, yes. Thank you, Janet. And, and I would like to say I'm so deeply grateful that you were there to be able to work with me with the try this, consider that, maybe remove this and go straight to that. It was just fantastic. And I really appreciate it. So um, I'm going to, oh, sorry. My name is Cher Obadiah from Six Nations. Um, also uh, Mohawk Ojibwe. So I have roots in Alderville First Nation, currently living uh, here in Hamilton, uh, Stony Creek. Uh, I'll be reading three little pieces. They're all very uh, short and sweet, but the three pieces are from three different parts of the book, from three different stages of my life, from a time in my life that was a very, very difficult. Um, I popped it back here. It's called uh, Shame to Shine. So it's a very crumpled up, crusty rose to a very full bloom rose, and that is ultimately the journey of Shame to Shine, and that comes from an abusive relationship and that this can definitely happen to anyone. I got myself tangled up in something. I went down some rabbit holes, but through that, it was just such a, a beautiful journey of reconnection to self. So um, what happened was I wrote a lot of poetry at a time I was not able to express to anyone else, carrying a lot of shame. So brand new poet, I've not written anything before. And so I would just write visited that file folder it was like a it's like I watched my own becoming so there was a lot of um sad stuff oh it says unstable can you hear me oh okay um 
So I noticed there was a lot of really sad stuff. And then as I was learning and, and transforming and understanding myself, there's a period of transformational understandings is what I like to call it. And then the third section is where I really started to bloom and feeling empowered. So I looked at it and I thought, holy smokes, I need to do something with this so that people who are in abusive relationships can understand that in that place of hopelessness, there is that place of empowerment. So uh, that's what called me to um, dig out my little poetic roots that were obviously there that just needed to come out. They're all uh, short and sweet. The first one is from the hurt section. My ears pressed tightly beneath my hands, wishing I was anywhere else. My facial features scrunched as another verbal assault finds my soft spots. I quickly lock the bathroom door, that damned useless lock he could pick, no problem. The doorknob turning twisted my stomach, my nerves already on their knees, praying for peace. My shame is safer in silence. His shadow side will subside. Things will get better. The real him will return, as if somehow his behavior isn't real. Intergenerational trauma expands and contracts in his chest, in his breath, in his past, and in our present. I'm a daughter of city-dwelling natives. No trauma, no culture, innocent, unaffected. I must be telling myself little white lies. This next one. From the second one here, um, it wasn't all bad and during the healing stages, I went back and found times of uh, happiness and joy was able to push me forward through forgiveness. And there were times that I did see that beautiful part of him. Um, but this one's called, I never told him. It's about uh, one of those beautiful moments that I did see. I never told him that my smile was not because of the silly lyrics in his songs or the dad in his jokes. I was smiling at his wild willingness to turn inside out, to turn back time and let his inner boy be with us. I was smiling because I was witnessing his spirit shine in real time. I was smiling because in that moment, his self judgments floated out the window along with the best damn eye rolling lyrics I've ever heard. So that was the second and the third where I really started to discover, discover uh, myself in a new way, getting connected culturally as well was very helpful. Started smudging all the time. And in a time that you can feel very lonely, I really started to uh, reconnect in a very beautiful way. So this one's called my DNA. The wounds of the indigenous warriors are cut deeply in my DNA. Their kaleidoscope of courage whispers in the ancient parts of my architecture. I carry their seeds within. I come from a long line. I come from a long lineage of lovemaking, my existence a time capsule of their victimhood and victories. My cells bleed from wounds I did not live as history repeats. The drum echoes like a lullaby, my toes tap without being told. The smell of sage runs its fingers through my hair under the same fiery sun my people prayed to. I'm never alone because woven within are their whispers of reverence and respect. My DNA is as divine as the lines on a leaf, a silent language I have finally learned to speak. So there you go. Those are, those are fantastic. Like that is, that is high quality poetry share, like so different from what you came, what you first came to me with. And it was like, because you were so open, you know, it takes a certain, amount of emotional maturity, profession, you know, just maturity overall to receive um, critique and feedback, you know, without being resistant and stamping your feet, which of course none of you did. So <laughs> it was so great. Um, now, pulling up the rear uh, for the grand finale, we have Dawn Hill and yes, and yes, Dawn is Haudenosaunee. So, you know, uh, if there seems to be a bias here, and there might be, but again, but again, that wasn't planned. It's just that what's happening right now. Um, Dawn, and again, I don't know if people know, but I'll tell uh, everyone um, on the uh, who's listening and viewing uh, that Don Hill is uh, the the author that I'm publishing on my new publishing label, Ojisto Publishing. So we're we're really gunning for this a summer publication, and we've been working hard, both of us, on on those edits and um, the stories. You're gonna you know love these stories. They're really really unique 
and really beautiful and really meaningful. So take it away, Don. Okay. Sego Seguego, Yungyat, Don Hill, Tuscarora, Nundage, Tikiduran, Oshwigan, Kinyagahaga, Niwaguhunzoda, Anola, Niwagit, Dalodin, Wagunweskuni, Ne Akyundo. What I just said was hello, everybody. My name is Don Hill. And I come from Tuscarora originally over in Lewiston, New York. That's where my dad was from, but my mother was from Six Nations. So when I retired from um, New York State employment, I moved back home. This is my home. This is where my mother was from. And I am a Turtle Clan and I am Mohawk. And Wagun Weskinine Akundo means I really like writing, I love it. It's my medicine, honestly. And I am going to share a story, which is chapter one of my book. It's called Disassociation. And it's about me trying to talk to my mother about her experience at the Mohawk Institute. Long ago, like 19. Okay, I'll, I'll just read it. All right. So my mom and I sat across from each other at a table at that table on an unseasonably warm Indian summer day in 1979. The dining room table sat at the far end of the living room. Behind the table was an oversized mahogany buffet that was chock full of my mom's beads and beadwork in various stages of completion. In the corner of the room was her matching mahogany curved glass china cabinet that held all her treasures. Our dining room table was so old, it probably could have qualified as an antique. It was a rectangular table with carved spindly barley twist legs that were joined by a cross structure underneath that probably gave it enough strength and stability to remain standing after a family of 15 gathered around it for hundreds of meals. There were white and scorch marks on the top where someone probably set down a hot pan. On each side of the table was a bench that my father had engineered many years before I was even born. It was made of two by fours with some rough hewn planks nailed on top with an apron on each side. At one time it was painted John Deere green, but you could hard, barely see that as the wood and paint had been worn smooth and shiny by all the children seated upon it over the years. None of the chairs matched and whatever fabric upholstering that once covered the seat of my chair was long gone. I could feel something crinkly underneath my legs as I sat there in my jeans and Oxford button down shirt. I was home for the weekend from Cuca College, an all girls college in the Finger Lakes region of New York. I was working on a paper about trauma and I wanted to ask my mother about all her experiences when she was in the Mohawk, was in the Mohawk mush hole as a child. At that time, I wasn't aware of the official name it went by, the Mohawk Institute. I only knew that everyone called it the mush hole. I had my pen in hand and a notebook I hoped to fill with all my mother's reminiscences about her time as a child interned there with her two sisters. She never spoke of it. So I wasn't sure which sisters were at the mush hole with her. It was probably about 10.30 on a Saturday morning. My mom had been up for a while and was sitting at the table, beating. Her long salt and pepper hair was braided and pinned up behind her head. This morning, it was a little unruly and wisps of it stood up around her face. My mom was once a beauty. After birthing and raising 10 children and living a life of hard knocks, she looked older than her 54 years. She had on an orange paisley patterned house dress and a pair of brown polyester pants underneath it. The pants I am sure her, sis her sister, Mary Penny, had made for her. The moo moo might have been a creation of my aunt Auntie Penn's too. My mom, Hazel Leona Van Every Hill, was born on the Six Nations Reservation in Oshwigan, Ontario in 1925. She was the eldest of 10 children born to Titus Fenevri and Vera Beulah Thomas. My mom shared the same dark complexion of her father as well as his rather prominent proboscis. Her grandpa Ty nose was passed on to my sisters Dolores and my brothers David and Ty. 
I can imagine myself practically dancing down those stairs because I wanted to get a jump on this paper. I wanted to get an outline drafted and hopefully read, ready to type up once I got back to Cuca. I sat down across from her, my pen and paper, set my pen and paper down and started to explain that I had just completed a paper on the Jewish Holocaust for my diversity and oppression class. And I mentioned how I wanted to write about her experiences at residential school. I wanted to contrast and compare her experiences with cultural and linguistic genocide to that of straight up genocide of the, oh, I can't turn my page, <laughs> genocide that the Jewish people experienced in Nazi Germany. I especially wanted to know how she and her sisters ended up at the mush hole, how long they stayed there, what she learned, what happened, what it was like for her. I began with a simple question of how old were you when you went there? At that moment, my mom changed before my eyes. She disappeared. Her eyes went blank and it seemed like she suddenly had, or maybe I always had nictating eyelids. Somehow, I never noticed that before. I saw, it, it looked like this other membrane had unexpectedly swept across her eyes and she no longer saw me or the room we sat in. I could imperceptibly hear a loud clang, like a gate was slamming shut around her. I continued to talk and I kept asking questions, but she had morphed into that girl with faraway eyes from that Rolling Stone song. I couldn't reach her anymore. It hit me like a sledgehammer. I was seeing someone dissociate. However, it wasn't in the midst of a therapy session. It was my mom. This was way too real and frightening. I thought it was all my fault. What I was studying at college and textbooks about psychological pathology somehow led to this chicken coming home to roost. She was definitely disconnected from her thoughts and probably her own identity in that moment. I always believed my professor when she said that the mind is a very powerful thing. It was in this moment, it was giving my mom a way out. She shut down, opted out, emotionally detached. I felt the cold hand of fear on the back of my neck and panic began to rise in me. My biggest fear was that I may never get her back. I called her name, Ma, Mom, Mama, but my voice didn't seem to register anywhere within her. I put my hand on her shoulder and she winced and pulled away. Louder, I said, Ma, Mama, can you hear me? Slowly, she relaxed a little and she blinked. Her eyes had changed and she seemed to regain some focus. She looked at me, but she didn't say anything. I said her name again and asked her if she was okay. It was taking her a little bit longer to process my question. I completely lost my desire to ask her any more questions. I didn't want to trigger more unpleasant or hurtful memories for her. She finally said she was okay. And then she picked up her needle and she continued to bead the edging on the barrette she had been working on. There was no more to say. All the questions I had were gone, left unasked. Whatever conversation we might have had was never to be. My concern for her emotional well being far overshadowed my desire for answers in that moment. It has been over 40 years since I attempted to expose my mother's tenuous connections to the memories from her childhood. I never tried to dredge up her recollections again. Over time, a thought occurred to me. In her silence, was she protecting herself or was she protecting me? Nyawagoa. 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 Let's everyone turn on your microphones because we're going to say a, a little, you know, thank you and goodbye. And I really want to thank all the people who tuned in today to help support these um, wonderful writers. As you could tell, it was an absolutely rich, wonderful 
um, collection of stories and poems and essays and um, you know musings that are that are really really meaningful and beautiful. So thank you guys for for offering that to the the public today. Well done, very well done, everybody. Great job, everyone. Yeah, yeah. Good job. thank you. I feel so really honored. It was amazing. Yeah. This is it. This is the finale. Thanks everyone for coming. Yeah. Yeah. Kathleen's going to sign us off, I think. <laughs> I'm going to just hop in right here. Yes. Um, I want to thank everybody for joining us tonight. This has been an amazing uh, evening celebrating words. I mean, words in all their forms. And I was, it was uh, an honor for me to, to be here to, to hear those words. So um, I just want to thank all of you who were willing to share your work. I know it takes a lot of courage and I, it's courage I don't have. So I admire it and thank you so much. Um, it's just a great way to celebrate the end of the writer in residence program for this year. Um, huge thanks to Colin, our tech guy. So thank oh my you, God, yes. Paul. <laughs> oh my gosh, Colin, who came back from holiday. We would be nothing yeah. without you, Colin. So thank you. Um, and to the teams at McMaster and HPL who have uh, done a lot of work behind the scenes to, to make all this work tonight too. The biggest thanks, of course, goes to Janet, uh, who has spent the last year and a bit um, sharing her knowledge and passion yes. and talent, of course, with uh the communities far and wide. So uh, we sincerely wish you the best on your future projects. I'm sure we'll, we'll hear all about them and uh, you know, keep in touch for sure. I'm sure you've made a lot of connections with folks and you will keep in touch with them. Um, so please continue to do that. Our communities will miss you immensely uh, when you're gone from this role, but uh, you know, thank you so much. So thanks everybody out there and everybody here for joining us tonight and go have a, a wonderful night. So thank yes. you again, everyone. Well done. Thank, thank you one. very much thank you. for hosting. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Happy thank Poetry Month and uh, everybody be well. <laughs>